Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome to this uh, special session, a special seminar uh, today um, where we are very, very privileged to have Paul Thompson uh, come and speak uh, on the subject of Greece and Eurozone uh, and the, the IMF perspective. Paul is the director of the IMF's uh, European department and uh, Paul and I go back a very long way. Uh, we were both at the IMF as young economists cutting our teeth on Yugoslavia when <coughs> Yugoslavia was still a nation. And um, at which point uh, our paths diverged slightly and Paul joined the European Department. You were the IMF's resident representative in Belgrade in the final years of the Yugoslavia. Uh, and then afterwards you worked on various countries in, in Eastern Europe, including the, the components of the successor states of Yugoslavia. You were mission chief also to, to Romania, I remember. Uh, also, um, a mission chief for Ukraine and for Russia, uh, where you were you actually were head of the IMF's Moscow office. Uh, so Paul has a very, very long experience of uh, Eastern Europe. However, in his final years, he turns attention to the problems of the Eurozone, and that's where our paths reconverged because he became the mission chief for Greece when I was the mission chief for Italy. And I was very anxious that he should be sure to put out the fires in Greece lest they waft over the Aegean and set fire to an even bigger potential bomb, which fortunately he succeeded in doing. However, uh, Greece has kept him extremely busy. He's still working on Greece even now, seven years after its first program. Uh, so he has uh, plenty of experience on this case, but he also worked on your mission chief. Were you the actual mission chief for Portugal? Yes. Um, and, and now, as the director of the Euro European Department, he has responsibility for the whole of all of the IMF's relationships with the countries of, of Europe. But uh, that's um, by way of introduction. I'm going to hand over to Paul um, to do a say. Thank you very much, Alan, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and, and uh, discuss these issues with you. Uh, Paul, but before I, I, I should just remind everybody that the the, the presentation that Paul will make is is on the record. Mm -hmm. uh, afterwards, there'll be a quick Q and A, questions and answers, which uh, will be on Chatterpass terms. Yes. So yeah, thanks. And uh, uh, so these are what I what I suggest uh, I, I do in the beginning. Talk to you a little bit about how we see the eurozone uh, uh, challenges more broadly. Uh, uh, if you're interested in that, and, and, and that, then I turn to Greece uh, 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 on, on, on to discuss with you the, the challenges we face there, and they are, as you know, considerable. Uh, first, let me say to you, I mean, uh, one of the sort of paradoxes is around that, that right now many of the sort of risks we have, we have pointed to in Europe uh, have actually materialized, uh, uh, not least the Brexit. Uh, but despite that, we are actually busy revising upward our, our, uh, our forecast, both for the Eurozone and for Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, so the recovery uh, is gaining momentum, uh, both in East and, uh, and uh, West. Uh, no, uh, but in the, if, we, if, we, and if we look at the Eurozone, uh, uh, I want to show you the start to show you this chart, which shows... Uh, uh, it shows unemployment and it shows what our our individual country estimate of the natural unemployment rate is. And you can see that we actually are the states now where most of the remaining unemployment is structural. So it's not cyclical. So the, we are not, our main concern here in, in looking forward is not demand, if you want to put it like that. It is structural problems in the, in the, in the Eurozone. It's a... Uh, a uh, few things. The Eurozone, there's a lot of talk of austerity, but actually in 1415 it was basically a neutral fiscal impulse for the Eurozone as a whole. And the last year we have, uh, uh, in 16, we had a, 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 an impulse of, 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 uh, of almost half a percent, and we are set to have something like the same this year. Together with, with QE, that's of course provided a very favorable environment. Now, one of the things we're worried about, of course, is if you look at the last three uh, years from 14 to 17, you see that the countries where there is least fiscal space in terms of debt to GDP are the countries that actually have relaxed their fiscal stance. So 
it's uh, uh, that's that's uh, that's potential a problem. And uh, if you want to look at forward, if you look at, we ask ourselves, where is the fiscal space? If you see here, the countries that need fiscal space that still have uh, a, a negative output gap are the countries that don't, don't have the fiscal space and that have a less fiscal space as a result of fiscal relaxation the last few years. So clearly one of the things that we are concerned about is that if there is a shock to the Eurozone again, that a number of countries would find it difficult not to have notable pro-cyclical tightening in the middle of, 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 a, of, 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 of a, a shock. So uh, this is sort of, so even though we, I say no, uh, conjuncturally, uh, the, the output are gaining momentum, we are concerned, and actually growth of 1.7 in the Eurozone is right now above what we think is, is the long-term uh, potential. Uh, uh, we, we are concerned about uh, 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 you know, risks go, going forward. Let me share with you a couple of, uh, of, of slides. We, are, we, are, we have a relatively modest view on long-term potential in, in the Eurozone, growth of only one and a half. It is in part because of crisis legacies, yes, but it is really because of structural problem that predates the uh, the, uh, the, the euro crisis. Here you see the relative unit labor cost in, in Germany and four southern countries. Uh, Germany is the red one. And you will see, uh, I should say, this is competitors relative to competitors. Not relative to Germany, but for each country is relative to their competitors. And you see the import of the Hartz reforms in Germany and the, the strong improvement in, uh, in, uh, 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 in, in competitors. And you see, this is start date is euro adoption, and you see how since Euro adoption, these uh, other countries lost significant uh, uh, competitiveness. Let me try to look at the two outliers, Italy and uh, Germany, just as an example. Uh, uh, you see, this is a picture of since Euro adoption, you will see that German wages and Italian wages have basically tracked each other very, very closely. In euro terms, in this is pure euro terms, uh, wage increases since euro adoption, and this is what has happened to uh, to uh, productivity uh, uh, and, and competitiveness. Since then, essentially, we have slowly opened up a gap of some 30 percent, and there is this seem to have stabilized, but there's no signs of it it uh, 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 narrowing. Uh, let's look a little a bit of. Of the on, on the other countries, there is a, 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 a unit labor cost is is is, a, is of course a, a com combination of changes in employment productivity uh, uh, output and if we uh, this this is what happened to the unit labor cost in these countries since the crisis. So you can see Germany has had some uh, deterioration in its unit labor cost. Italy has had further deterioration. The other countries have improved. But you see, they have improved almost exclusively by adjusting employment, which of course is not sustainable. Uh, which is another, uh, 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 which which is another indication of, of 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 the fundamental structural problems that are still with us in the in the eurozone. So I think, in terms of policy conclusions, what are what are we saying in the fund? Uh, We, I, I think, people talk a lot about the architecture. The architecture needs to be uh, completed, and we, we certainly agree on that, for sure. But the main problems are really at the national level. Structural reforms in a number of, of countries uh, 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 that, that, that clearly have trouble uh, 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 staying competitive. That's one part of it, and our advice is, is very much an acceleration of structural reform in, in these countries. There are a number of countries with fiscal space, like Germany, that we think should need to use this fiscal space. There are a number of countries right now that's already uh, calling for a tightening of monetary policy, even though core inflation is still below 1%. And our, our warning to these countries are that you have signed up to a common monetary policy, uh, calibrated to achieve a, a euro-wide inflation target, and you cannot call for a tightening of monetary policy at this stage of the cycle. And uh, 
you know, for countries where the output gap is largely closed, like Germany, they would have to accept that inflation go above uh, the European average, the target, for, 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 for some time, and it would definitely be premature to start the tightening of monetary policy. So these are our advice to, uh, uh, to individual countries. I think it's, it's very important to understand we are inside a currency union that is not a political union, that is sometimes difficult to understand what that means if you're outside, outside uh, uh, the union, but it is, it's most of the policy advice still you know, is directed to countries at the national level. We are advocating uh, uh, to complete banking union, to complete uh, 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 capital markets union, uh, but no progress that is politically feasible in, you know, in the next few years will fundamentally change this situation that I showed to you and the ability to deal with shock. The ability to deal with shock will really depend at uh, policies on the, at the national level. So that's uh, sort of a sum of how we, uh, we, see, the, we, we see the Eurozone. Uh, 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 there clearly are some, uh, uh, some fundamental long-term challenges. If, you, if I were to, to show you a chart that asks, uh, no, that shows convergence of the Eurozone members before Eurozone was established. The founding members, you will see that there was convergence. Countries with lower per capita, per capita GDP uh, grew faster than, uh, than countries with, with higher per capita GDP. Since the Euro adoption and until the crisis, that conversion stopped. And actually, since the crisis, there have been divergence. Uh, 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 and, and these are, as I said at the start, in our view, fundamentally reflect structural problems. Uh, 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 and not so much a question of, of, of demand and demand management. Okay, uh, I think this is enough about the Eurozone, and let me talk about uh, uh, Greece, which uh, uh, no, clearly is a case that has posed significant challenges to the, to the fund, uh, and certainly to the Greeks and, and its Europe, uh, European partners. I'm going to talk to you about these six issues, the political crisis, the ownership of the program, uh, uh, the reason for the output collapse, the domestic fiscal adjustment, and the poor quality of what we think that the fiscal adjustment, and the debt issue, and the structural reforms. And, uh, uh, let me take it in that. Uh, so let me start by giving you a chart that tells you, in my view, perhaps the most important chart of, 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 of all of them. This is uh, the program we had with Ireland. We had two finance ministers and two prime ministers, and uh, uh, the green is when it was off track, uh, on track, and the red was when it was off track. And this is uh, the program with Portugal. It went a bit off track at the end, but that was actually when they had reached get market, market access, and they, they didn't need us. And this is the program with Greece, where we have now had uh, 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 including interim ministers, ten, 10 finance ministers and seven prime ministers. I, it's, I'm sh showing this as no, just to illustrate the, the political dimension, the political crisis that is part of, 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 of the Greek problem, uh, the, the Greek uh, 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 the, the challenge we face in, uh, in, uh, in Greece. And the, the EFF program, we had the four year EFF program, was off track. Uh, was off track almost 80% of the time, uh, three quarter of the time. We completed five of 16 reviews. We completed five or 16 reviews, uh, 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 and mainly because of disagreement of structural reforms. Uh, structural reforms were, 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 were in, our, in our view, not in line with what was supposed to be under the program. One fundamental difference between all of these countries was that only in Greece did we not have broad political support from the outset. Both in Portugal and Ireland, there was a broad coalition supporting the program from the start. In Greece, there was significant opposition from the main opposition parties from the outset. Uh, you know, when I, when I negotiated the Portuguese program, we actually, with the socialist government, we had parallel discussion with the social democratic government, with the knowledge of the socialist government, to be sure that everything we, we did had broad political support. And uh, uh, when, when the social democrat later came in and took over, there was a sort of seamless transition as far as the program implementation is, con 
is concerned. Uh, okay, so this recurrent political crisis that we have had in Greece has clearly affected uh, the program. I mean, I think we have four periods. The first year until the end of the program, we had relative good program implementation. As I said, there was the main opposition opposed the program from the start, but last year I think we were up to a good start. Then we had a, a, a period of one and a half year where the reformers gradually lost support. We had sort of gradual disintegration uh, of the cohesion inside the government. They ended up in a technocratic government uh, and multiple election. And that was first when Brexit was put on the table uh, uh, as, an, as an issue. Then we had a prolonged period where uh, finally we had a broad establishment party support for the program. Uh, uh, but almost from the start, uh, the sub political support from that government started to erode. We saw a spectacular decline in popular support for the sort of traditional establishment party. So we have, we have a new government that reversed an important part of the program and now have put it back on track, I would say. Uh, 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 but, and we sort of had this uh, Brexit scare too, uh, 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 on, on that sort of ended with the ESM programming. In, 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 in the middle of 2015. But, so the, the point uh, here is, so you have these four periods, and you should not be surprised, of course, that you have a total collapse in the confidence. Economics is about confidence, right, to a large extent. And the, all the confidence indicators essentially <coughs> collapsed. You have the government bond yields, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, deposits, deposits halved uh, in nominal terms, and uh, and you have a, a, a total collapse of investments uh, 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 in, uh, during the same uh, uh, period. So, not surprisingly, during this period, we constantly underestimated growth. You know, each time we came there, well, there was huge another confidence shock to the economy, and we constantly revised growth downwards until uh, until we sort of uh, we had this broad coalition party and and, and, and economics started to to stabilize. Uh, uh, in, in 2012, 2013, and, and we sort of grows have more or less been on, on, on the uh, track. I show this also because we are being accused right now of always being too pessimistic on growth. Uh, we actually uh, have a, a record of getting it wrong, but if the opposite direction. So, we, as I say, we constantly over, on the overestimate output as, polit as the political crisis gradually deepened. The fiscal multipliers, yes, I think we underestimated fiscal multipliers. We, uh, we, had the, we took the OECD multipliers, and I think they are too small. No doubt about that. But all this analytical academic work on multipliers out of Greece, none of them are just for these confidence factors, no, for this dramatic collapse of confidence. So I have actually not seen what I uh, sort of more, more realistic uh, 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 projection of multipliers. We did got multipliers wrong, but the more important part thing was that the political crisis and the confidence shock sort of caused this collapse in output. That does not, of course, say that it was well, that that we were not could not have done better on output. A fundamental problem is whether there would have been less political crisis if the program would have been structured differently. So let's talk about talk about uh, uh, that. I think if we talk about Greece. We need to understand that the, the uh, focus on fiscal adjustment was inevitable. That if you if you look at you know, Ireland, Portugal, and Spain, this monetary windfall from euro adoption, when they suddenly went from their own interest rate to essentially German interest rates in a short period, was used to uh, to primarily finance private consumption, property booms uh, uh, in, in in particular. In Greece, the windfall was used entirely on a fiscal relaxation. Uh, so it's it's uh, uh, no the, the 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 Greek program became about fiscal consolidation austerity if you want, in a way that the others did uh, did not do inevitably. This is Greece uh, until they had no the green is the Maastricht uh, uh, the time of the Maastricht criteria having to be met. You see there was a, 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 a ambitious effort to bring down. Uh, a fiscal deficit, and as soon as Greece was inside the eurozone, there was a massive uh, relaxation, and Greece has not met the targets, the Maastricht targets, one single year since being member of the of the eurozone, with this uh, spectacular uh, increase in deficit to, to uh, 15 percent. 
this is just uh, the DXDs. So I, my last point here is, yes, we, this points to failure in, the, in Greece, in the policy-making institution, but it also points to the problem of, of European governance. Again, we are inside, the, we are inside this Eurozone that's not a political union with no effective way of, 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 of ensuring uh, uh, fiscal prudence in, in member countries, uh, 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 member countries that gain the benefit of the, co of the common monetary policy and the low uh, interest rates. The driver was a spectacular increase in public wages and pensions. Uh, uh, this is uh, the real wages and pension bills in 2009 relative to 2000. <laughs> This is the increase in the public sector wages, public sector pension, and this is the increase in productivity of the economy. So, uh, 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 no, we had, and this is the picture for the Eurozone as a, as a whole. In particular, social benefits and contribution, social benefit took off from 2004, and contribution actually started uh, 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 shrinking. So, as a result of that, we uh, now, with this huge deficit, as I said, fiscal consolidation became inevitable, significant fiscal consolidation. This is just to show that, yes, it was ambitious, but it was not un unprecedented. We had, we had uh, you know, uh, this is the four large consolidations in, in Europe that we, uh, it's uh, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and I think Belgium. And you will, of course, say, with the benefit of hindsight, once you have one should have realized that the policy-making institutions in, uh, in Greece are not as strong as, as in these other countries, and that is true, uh, with the benefit of hindsight. But ex ante, this is you know, uh, not how it, we, we looked at it at, at that time. Uh, so, should we have had slower, slower fiscal adjustment? Uh, this, is a, this is a size of the average IMF program since 1999. This IMF support and support from other uh, uh, bilateral, bilateral or multilateral credit, uh, exceptional balance of payment support, non-market-based balance of payment support from IMF and others in support of IMF program. This is what we did in Iceland and Ukraine, about 35, 40% of quota. This is Cyprus, Ireland and Portugal program, and this is the Greece program. Uh, so we have an economy where we have put in together with the European partners, not only IMF, but with the European partners, what is 145% of GDP. It is dramatically different from anything else that we have done in the IMF. This is financing. That's financing. Yeah. It's just financing. Of course, some of you will say, uh, but that's in part because you bailed out uh, foreign banks, and I will, I will uh, 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 get to that. We bailed them out for 18 months. We'll get to that uh, be before there was a PSI. And we, if we ask what we would have saved if we had not done this for 18 months, uh, uh, we would uh, have saved this much. So, uh, uh, you know, still, even without the bailout, there would have been uh, significant. Uh, 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 there would have been significant increase in financing. So, I, I do think that you no. Know, to sum it up, the pace and scope of fiscal adjustment was totally inevitable. It was a consequence of the of the of the size of of, of size of the size of the initial uh, deficit. Uh, the adjustment was ambitious, very ambitious, very ambitious, no doubt about it, but not unprecedented. An even slower adjustment would that have been pol politically realistic? Inside a currency union that is not a political union, it's this is a this is a, a currency union that says we are not a transfer union, and. Uh, Look at the scale of the transfers or, or, or of the support already. So, for those who argue that we should have even slower fiscal adjustment, it uh, it, it would have even. You what know, one have to ask if it was politically realistic? Still, a legitimate question. So, now we get sort of a bit more forward looking because we we deal with now we get to the issues that we are dealing with right now in our negotiations with Greece. Uh, I think one of the things is that the quality of the fiscal adjustment in the last few years, I should stress in the last few years, first, there's no doubt that Greece have undertaken an extremely impressive fiscal adjustment. Extremely impressive. There's no doubt that the hardship on the Greek population as a result of this is unprecedented. No doubt about that. Uh, 
our argument is that the quality of adjustment the last two or three years has not been right. And note that we have not dispersed for three years. We have not been willing to disperse for three years. We've not been able to reach agreement for, for three years now, in part because of, of the problems that I'm going to discuss with you now. As I, as I showed you before, the, we had a sharp deterioration in primary balance until the crisis. It's 12% uh, uh, shows the other number compared to 2000, I think. But this is compared to 99, it was 12%. And the change since then, under the program, has basically reversed it, more or less reversed it. Uh, Deterioration of 12% and Im improvement of, of, of 10%. One thing that has happened is that the wage bill has been lowered. Greece has a significant problem with public sector employment. It's, uh, uh, it's the only country in Europe, in the Eurozone, where the average wages of the public sector are well above the average sector in the private, private sector. In the rest of Europe, it's, it's the other way around. Uh, we have managed to significant, Greece has managed to significantly reduce uh, 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 the number of public sector employees essentially through an attrition rule. Uh, the problem with that is that these people have been transferred into a pension system that is basically unaffordable. So you have, despite, despite pension reforms, significant pension reforms, and reduction in nominal pensions, you have actually that, that the, 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 the pension system, and I'll get to that, has, has been significantly burdened because you have essentially transferred an unsustainable situation in the, in, in, on, from, on the wage bill to the pension bill. So problem are migrated from pension rates to pension bill. <coughs> Instead of dealing with that, what the adjustment have to a large extent been achieved by cutting and cutting discretionary spending and capital spending to, to levels where they that today are an outlier inside Europe. And well, you know, hospitals have no syringes, uh, buses have no spare parts, and we have too much of a compression of, of, of discretionary spending and capital spending to what we think are unsustainable levels. On the revenue side, we have had an unsustainable reliance on hiking taxes on an already narrow tax base. So we have a narrow tax base, I'll get to, I'll illustrate that, and we kept on hiking taxes on narrow ta tax base, and that has exacerbated an already serious tax avoidance problem. So unresolved fiscal problem number one, this is that one, high taxes on a narrow base. This shows you the very high tax-free income threshold under the personal income tax system, which shows you uh, uh, that that's more than half the household, almost 60%, are exempt from... Uh, from personal income taxes, uh, the European average is, is you see it, uh, it's written down there, is, is, is well below uh, 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 20 percent. So over 50 percent of wage earners, 6 percent of household, exempt from income taxes. Uh, There's about 10 percent of household in the euro area. Tax-free threshold is 40 percent of average wages, about 20 percent euro. That is a key part of the problem. That essentially the whole middle class they're trying to exempt it from taxation. <coughs> This shows the same. I mean, this is really this is this is the attempt of taxing the rich. I I have no problem with trying to tax the rich. Don't misunderstand, but it has to work. And the next slide I think is one of the more interesting ones. When I started out in Greece in 2010 with the program, one of the things that was surprised me was that the tax compliance rate was less than 75 percent. This is the rate of collection every year relative to assessments every year. We have put in more technical assistance than we have put into any other country ever in our history. And the re uh, despite that, we now have a co compliance rate that's less than 50%. Mm. We fundamentally think it's because of a policy of increasing rates on a very, very narrow base. It's not working. Okay. Uh, unresolved fiscal problem number two. We think the pension system, I saw you, this, I showed you before this spectacular increase in pension and social transfers. This compared, this is, these numbers I'm going to show you now are all based on Eurostat, Eurostat uh, information. I'm comparing Germany and Greece and I'm taking 2014 numbers. Uh, I'm told that it's more or less the same if we look at 15, but 2014 is the only way I have all the numbers comparable. So the standard pension in Germany and Greece, the standard pension is about the same in euro terms. Now, of course, Germany is a much more, much richer country. 
The average wage in Germany is more than twice of that in, uh, in Greece. As a result, the, uh, the, the a German uh, can expect to have 41% of his, his uh, standard of, of his wage of his wage replaced when he retired. Uh, in, in Greece, it's almost 80%, so twice as much in Greece. And of course, Greece is not so good as Germany is at collecting social security contribution. So if we ask ourselves, take a snapshot today of collection and entitlement, the average, some German, according to how the system is today, in a lifetime, how much more would they take out than they put in? In Germany, uh, uh, taking into account also, I forgot, the retirement age in Germany is still five years uh, uh, higher than in, in Greece. Taking into account that contributions are lower, we find that in, in, in Germany, you take out about 30% more than you put in. In Greece, you take out 180% compared to what you put in. And not surprising, of course, Germany has to transfer about 3% from the state to the pension system every year. In Greece right now, it's 11%. This one, and this is how the situation looked for Europe as a whole. So this is this shows you that we're in Greece we have these transfers from the budget to the pension system of about 11% a year, compared to a European average of about two and a half percent. And this is why we say that the uh, uh, that reform of the pension system is is just a, a critical part of of, uh, uh, of regaining uh, uh, control of the situation. This shows you uh, that most of the adjustment in Greece compared to Portugal, Cyprus, Ireland has been on, on the revenue side and not so much on the, on, on, on the expenditure side. Uh, it's just a summarizing what I, what I showed you before. Let, be, before I go on, this is, this is essentially what is under discussion now, where we and the Greeks have disagreed. We have said that we want you to reform the personal income tax and the pension system to create savings, not, and I stress, not to have more austerity, not to have higher, higher surpluses, but to have a more gross-friendly budget that allow this compression of discretionary spending to be released and, and capital spending to go up and for Greece to have more targeted social spending. One of the problems is that you no know, granny's pension check that you get uh, is actually supporting a, a wider family, and we accept that. That's, uh, one cannot just re you know, take away that. One needs to replace it with targeted social benefit. So for us, it is, it is a question of not of having more austerity, but having a budget that is much more growth friendly. Greece is a fundamentally an economy that needs dramatic modernization. And we do not believe that that modernization is possible if, you, if Greece doesn't get somewhat of the same targeted social welfare system. It doesn't have an unemployment compensation system, for instance. Uh, 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 otherwise, I don't think there would be political and social support for this modernization that Greece has to go through. So that's, that's a, 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 a part of the problem. We in the front have a bit of a PR problem because time and again, Greece agrees with its European partners on targets, fiscal targets, that we actually think are too ambitious, and we say so, and they say, well, we can, we can do it. Next morning when we come and say, okay, let's discuss the measures for how to get there. Now, we are being blamed for the targets. Uh, 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 we, we, we think, right now, for instance, we are arguing that uh, the targets of 3.5% over the medium term, I shall get to that, just too ambitious. We are recommending one and a half, but we are still recommending that take measures because we think even to have one and a half, you will not be able to grow without making the budget considerably more growth friendly. Let's talk about debt. This is uh, the thing that everybody wants to talk to me about, so let's talk about it. Uh, uh, so here, uh, no, debt relief eventually became inevitable, no doubt about that. When we sort of, this, this is just a picture of how the debt was increasing, it's familiar. Let's, no, so the initial debt strategy in 2010, uh, the DSA on approval, I think this is interesting. People often say, oh you, oh, you failed to see that debt would increase. The original paper we put out, to the request for the program, had debt going from 115 to 160 percent. 
Why? Because we're in a currency union where you cannot devalue. So if you need to improve your competitiveness, you need internal devaluation. So the program actually had nominal decline, nominal decline in GDP assumed for the first two or three years. And as a result of that, you had this, this uh, increase in debt, debt uh, to GDP. You know, I, I also did the program with Iceland two years before. And it's interesting because Iceland started out with debt in year one of the program, also about 115. And we projected within three years. I cannot remember the exact number, so at, on the top of my head. I think we projected it was down to 85, 90%. No, ex -ante. So here you have two programs that on the day of approval were dead more or less the same and one of them have it going up to 160 and the other one down to 85 simply because the one has inflation and the other one has internal devaluation. Uh, so uh, now doing a program inside a currency union is a difficult thing. Doing a program inside a currency union that is not a political union, and I keep on coming back, is extremely difficult. It's a... Uh, so, why was there no PSI at the beginning? There was many reasons for that. Okay, well, PSI. Because there was public sector, uh, private sector involvement. Bail-in of banks, if you want. Bail-in of banks. Sorry for the terminology. Uh, there was not, and I should say, the Greek authorities themselves strongly did not want it. Uh, it was, it was uh, you know, clearly discussed. There were several issues. I mean, remember, this was 18 months after Lima. The world was still very fragile. There was no firewalls. There was no ESM. There was absolutely no firewall. The Europeans had no systems in place for dealing with uh, a debt crisis inside their uh, currency uh, unions. So no firewalls. And people could not even tell me who is holding the debt. No, I did not have any details on who was holding the debt. Uh, 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 so it was, you know, there was clearly concern of spillovers to, uh, to uh, Adam in Italy and, uh, 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 and, and other places. So uh, this, this was, the, this was un, un, undoubtedly a, a, a concern. So the strategy had two fundamental features. No debt relief and ambitious targets, clearly very ambitious targets for adjustment fundamentally assuming if Greece was given time, Greece could give, grow its way out of the problem uh, with, a, with a strong policy implementation. And what that, so the strategy here required that we went in with a lot of money because of course we, were, we knew that when markets saw that we ex and they even project debt to go up to 160% of GDP, that would spook markets. So we know that they need to be taken out of the market for a prolonged period to establish a track record to show that you no know, policies are under control and it's on the downward trend. So this was quite unprecedented for the fund to go into a program where we take them out for, for, for two to three years out of uh, uh, the market. Now, by 2011, uh, uh, end of 2011, uh, middle of 2011, 2000, uh, uh, it was clear that things have changed. Output kept on going down because of this political confidence crisis, uh, and we had increasing political instability. Uh, and at the same time, uh, outside, uh, uh, we started hearing some people talk about Brexit, and uh, and clearly uh, this all the confidence problem fed into each other, and uh, inter domestic and internal uh, uh, negative confidence shocks. Output went down, and it was became clear to us increasing that one cannot avoid PSI a public and a private sector in involvement. And what also happened at that time, in, in the meantime, the ESM was established with firewalls. So Europe started having a firewalls in place. That reduced the, the sense of, of, of the fear of contagion. And I also think there was a sense of, of that Greece was an, an outlier uh, uh, in, and people were less concerned about, uh, became increasingly less concerned about the spillover of the PSI. This shows you uh, for you know, the, the, the big restructuring, debt restructurings, public, private sector debt restructuring in the fund programs for, uh, uh, I think, the last 20 years or so. Uh, 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 you see the NPV reductions on the, on the left side, and you see on, 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 the, on, on the horizontal axis, you see the size of restructured debt relative to GDP, and this shows you where Greece lies there. So the Greek... PSI in terms of the NPV reduction in debt 
was among the highest. And in terms of the size of the restructured top relative to GDP, it was again an extreme outlier. It was, it was big. It was big. The world had not seen anything like that at that time. So uh, this was an important, important change. But output continued to go down. Confidence shocks con continued. And it became clear that PSI was not enough. So we have, this is the next acronym, sorry about that, OSI, Official Sector Involvement. Uh, long negotiations leading up to the Paris Club agreements. Uh, I think it was at the end of 2012, and this is all sort of, uh, 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 with, the, with, the, with the Paris Club, uh, that, uh, 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 that essentially gave Greece an enormous extension of its maturity structure. By now, Greece has the most favorable maturity structure of any advanced country in the world. Very long maturities. And it has most of its debt at German rates, if you want, at AAA rates. So look at that. You see at the lower end, you see debt has gone up from 110 to 180% of GDP. But the burden of the debt have halved from 2009 to 2006. That in 2009, before the crisis, crisis Greece paid 12 billion in interest payments. In 2016, it's the same in 15, uh, uh, they paid less than 6 billion because of the extremely low interest rates. Uh, and it's fallen from 5 to 3 percent of GDP. This is why the Europeans are arguing and that Greece have received spectacular debt relief uh, uh, and you guys, he's telling us when we are saying that there's call for more debt relief, cannot come and say that the, the, the sort of increase in debt, uh, is, has, uh, including the bailout, the cost of the bailout, is burden in Greece because Greece is actually in a better situation in terms of the transfer problem associated with debt than it was before the crisis. Uh, this just shows uh, uh, you know, the, the interest payments in Greece uh, uh, relative to the rest of, uh, of, of uh, Europe. Now, with this agreement with, to get OSI, it was the debt framework was put in place, basically had a commitment by European partners that if debt is not down to 122% by 2020 and 110% by 2022, they will provide more debt relief. They didn't specify how, but they would, there was not taken to do that, provided the program is on track. Uh, so, during this period from 12, 13, and 14, we actually saw some stabilization. And by the middle of 14, my team would tell me that we would not need to ask the European for more debt relief under this agreement because actually debt was set to decline in line with these targets. And, and you actually, Greece had re, started regaining market access. There was a tentatively reopening of market access in the second half of 2014, which was sort of the market's way of saying that they looked at it a bit the same as my team did, uh, uh, no, that this, this sort of seemed to be in line with what we are projecting. Then we started having significant problem with program implementation. And here I, I want to stress that that started already in 2014. Uh, we, as I said, we have not completed a program since uh, I think the first half of 2014, have completed a, 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 made a dispersion. So the program implementation problem started even before the current government took over. I think that's important to, it's not just a question of, 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 the, of, the, of the current government. I think it's a more fundamental problem of, 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 of the strength of vested interest in the, in the Greek political system. One should not just blame one party uh, uh, over, over, the, uh, over the other. So we actually had, uh, you know, but the, the current government did some program reversals and I think they have basically put it back on track. But you, you all know the situation from, from the first half of 2015 uh, that led up to the capital control and, and uh, another sharp downturn in output and uh, uh, need for significant injection of capital into a banking system 
uh, that had that had major problem, uh, 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 and that caused debt to to surge again, and debt was getting close to 200. Per, uh, peaking in our projection at close to 200 percent and clearly uh, you know leading us to conclude that debt is again highly unsustainable and that that Greece needs debt relief by which we mean you know whatever Greece does in terms of reform and adjustment and that it should do uh, it will not be enough to deal with the debt uh, Greece needs needs debt relief from its European partners uh, it's on, on the debt relief, uh, uh, the discussions are going on. I think that there is, a, uh, I think there is a movement towards something that is much more realistic. That for a long time, the targets were based on Greece having first four and a half, then three and a half primary surplus from here and on till forever. And the fund could not support this simply no, saying that it's not where few countries, no country in the world have had 4.5% primary surpluses for three or four decades. A notion that a country like Greece, with relatively weak policy-making institution and deep unemployment problem, we project that unemployment will remain in double-digit levels for several more decades. The assumption that they can withstand political pressures to spend primary surpluses, even if they were up to 45 I just <laughs> think, don't think it's realistic. So we, we have, you know, and of course... Any country that you can assume that has primary surplus of three and a half, four and a half, does not have much of a debt problem over the long run. Uh, so you can define the way that 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 way. And we have we have not we have argued with this. And I think now uh, the numbers that are on the table are dramatically much more realistic on on the debt relief, on the assumption about the primary surplus that should be used to calibrate the debt relief. Similar on uh, on growth. Uh, some, in, initially, the assumption was that Greece, which has had the lowest productivity growth in the Eurozone since the start of the Eurozone, would move to have the highest. It's not realistic, of course. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, here, uh, uh, the assumptions are uh, much more reasonable. Uh, this is a discussion that's going on. I'll come back to where we stand uh, today, but uh, uh, this discussion goes on. But I, I think clearly there have been movement in Europe uh, towards something that is considerably more realistic than, than we had before. Last comments on structural reforms. Uh, you know, this is uh, uh, this is what I showed you initially. Also, just for Greece, do you, do you have the, the loss of competitiveness uh, uh, in, uh, in in Greece relative to the to the center until the crisis. Uh, uh, there was competitiveness gap of, of thirty percent. No exchange rate. No, so significant reforms were needed. Uh, to restore competitiveness. Uh, uh, no, we came in late, only a few weeks before default would have happened, so there was really no time to specify reform in, in, much, in much detail. Uh, 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 so therefore, the emphasis was on macro and financial issues. This is pretty standard in IMF program. We always come into, you know, at the very late in the program, and uh, 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 reforms are sort of done as we go along. It's, it's all, all pretty standard. Uh, so. Now, I think one area where Greece have done very significant reforms is in the labor market. And particular at the one fundamental change came at the, after the Cannes summit in 2011, November 2011 or something like that, where clearly European leaders became very exasperated with Greece. And for the first time, European leaders started talking about Brexit and started talking about the fundamental choices Greece will have to make. And I think that was clearly a wake-up call to the you know, Greece body politic. And uh, uh, you know, one had this uh, coalition, uh, uh, technocratic government headed with Papademos uh, that had broad political support. And that, that government did fundamental labor market reforms, good labor market reforms. Uh, so this is it says that no, it, it's uh, the collective bargaining was reformed, not abandoned as people claimed it was not, but essentially it sort of allowed uh, a much more closer realignment of ent of wages at the enterprise level with the financial situation at at the enterprise uh, level. Uh, this is what I say there. Now, uh, 
So this is what happened to, uh, to wages. There's no doubt that wages have adjusted significantly in Greece. No doubt about it. And I will also argue that they have adjusted too much. But hear my argument uh, uh, true. It's a, a, what, what we did not have and where I think the Greek program has significantly underperformed is in opening up what is still fundamentally a very closed economy. No, restriction on closed professions, uh, 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 no, closed uh, markets. If there were some reforms there. I think they have been slow, they have been uh, hesitant and, and piecemeal. There has been fierce resistance to liberalize closed sectors. And, 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 uh, and as a result, despite that we have had a collapse of output of 25%, deep, deep recession, no, we have not seen a decline in prices. Exceptional price rigidity. So we still have all these sectors where we can go out and say, no, a product like a certain medicine or whatever it is, we can go out and say in Athens it costs 40% no, more than in, uh, in, 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 in Europe because of the closeness of markets. And this is our view. Uh, no, so this, this shows you the decline in real wages, right? At labor markets were reformed, but product and service markets were not reformed. So the burden of adjustment felt too much on labor. I completely ag uh, uh, agree with, uh, with, with that. Another way of putting it, that the Greece closed the gap between real wages and productivity by reducing real wages, not by increasing productivity, if you want to put it like that. So, and that is, of course, not sustainable socially. I, uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, this just shows you that uh, you know, the adjustment has taken place, but mainly by, by reducing uh, 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 wages. So I, I, uh, I think the conclusion of the government is another issue that's being discussed right now. The pressure to reverse the labor market reform. I think that would be a mistake. What one need to do is one need to redouble efforts to open up that closed economy. That's the right policy conclusion to draw from that. So, uh, so, but that's one of the you know, of the things we are discussing uh, right now. Okay, long way to go. Just uh, this is my last slide. This is exports, excluding tourism, in Ireland, Portugal, and Spain, Greece, uh, 2016 over 2008. Fundamentally, we have not. Where you have had this export-led growth in uh, in the other economies, you have not uh, seen that in uh, in Greece. And I think, in part, it's, uh, it's many issues, but it's part the lack of the opening up of the economy. It's clearly also a reflection of the confidence problem and the unresolved debt problem. It has a, it has a number of, of, of reasons uh, uh, for that, uh, but that needs to be solved. This shows you what I. It's not a, this is not a very encouraging picture, but uh, this shows you for the other European crisis economy, T is the time of the crisis, and we are now, you know, uh, after seven years, this is where we are in the other uh, uh, countries. This is what happened in the Asian crisis, that uh, 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 already after what was after three years, they were above the pre-crisis. And they had a flexible exchange rate. And they had a flexible exchange rate. This is what happened in the Great Depression. This is Greece. <laughs> so, it's a, let, me, let me sort of be, just sum up uh, where, where we are right now. So, this is sort of as the overview of the challenges we face, the many challenges we face on, uh, on, on Greece. Uh, so where are we right now? We are in the midst of discussion that's actually going on and just coming up from Brussels and I'm going back uh, tomorrow morning to continue uh, discussions with the government. Uh, the key issues are uh, in particular on the, on the, on, in the fiscal in the, uh, in the public sector, tax reform, pension reform, to, uh, that will create fiscal space to have, a more, you know, to have more gross friendly policies in our view and not fiscal space in order to allow Greece to have higher surpluses and repay the debt. That's not what it's about from our perspective. Uh, and there is a discussion there, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I think clearly we are not there, but I also think that the differences have been narrowed notably the last few days. The second issue is on labor market reforms, uh, 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 where we are uh, arguing what I said before, the issue is really not to reverse labor market reform, but uh, 
redouble efforts in other years of structural reforms. Uh, uh, once we have agreement with Greece on policies, the next step would be to have agreement with with the Europeans on debt relief. We're not going to take a program to the board that uh, you know, we are not here to provide liquidity support. We will only support if we have a program that has solved long-term issues that requires reform in Greece and it requires debt relief. No amount of reform in Greece will make that sustainable. No amount of debt relief will allow Greece to pay German level pensions. So uh, it is, there need to be reforms on both sides. And uh, uh, this is where we are right now. There's a lot of emphasis on discussion between us and the Greeks on, uh, on policies. Uh, once we have settled that, there will be a lot of tension on discussion between us and the Europeans on debt. We have said to the Europeans that uh, it's fine to make debt contingent. What does that mean? that the debt relief will not be delivered before the end of the program, based on Greece meeting the objectives of the program. That's fine. But we would still want to have an understanding right now, uh, at least a broad understanding, what kind of measures would, would be needed. So that's a discussion that still needs to be had. Good. Thank you very much, Paul.